Hello and welcome to this episode of Voices of the Blue, brought to you by Law Dog Coffee. I'm Lieutenant Randy Sutton, the founder and CEO of the Wounded Blue, the national support and assistance organization for injured and disabled law enforcement officers. There are many law enforcement agencies throughout the United States who have policies which mandate a cop injured in the line of duty must recover both physically and mentally and resume full duty within one year or lose their job. The department will argue manpower issues and indicate they must fill the position. But where does this leave the law enforcement officer who willingly sacrificed their well-being in the line of duty? A cop can lose as much as 75% of their income, depending on the state, after being injured and entering the workers' comp system. And while those behind closed doors ensure a difficult road for our cops to receive the treatment they need and deserve, the emotional and financial toll becomes a burden, causing their way of life to suddenly crumble with nowhere to turn. Often, the result sees many law enforcement officers who are left to feel forgotten and alone spiral down the dark path of depression. Today, two former Texas cops tell their stories. I saw my MRIs for the first time and it was bad and I was angry because it completely validated the pain that I had been feeling for those months. Sarah McCree began her law enforcement career as a police officer with the Cottonwood Shores Police Department in 2015, moving on to join the Blanco County Sheriff's Department in 2017. Both are small Texas agencies, with the latter employing 11 full-time sworn officers. As the lone deputy working on the morning of April 17, 2018, Sarah was en route to the office to check her email when her life as she knew it would forever change. I was driving down the highway. In a marked unit, there was a vehicle in front of me who made a left-hand turn, and we slowed down to maintain distance, and I was struck from behind. Sarah's Dodge Ram police vehicle, similar to this one, was rear-ended by a large cargo truck at 70 miles per hour, leaving her no time to react. I looked in my rear mirror in a peripheral and I saw a grill and that was it and it was coming. It happened so fast, I, I really didn't even have a chance to brace. It pushed me off the road, it put me into a tailspin and pushed me into the median sideways. I actually missed a, a culvert, a cement culvert by like a foot and a half. If I would have hit it, I would have rolled. When a law enforcement officer is injured in a traffic accident, agencies typically adhere to a policy entailing the officer and the supervisor to complete an occupational injury report with the officer receiving immediate medical attention, including transportation to a hospital if the officer or EMS personnel deem it necessary. Sarah reported shoulder pain about 45 minutes after the accident, but for reasons unknown, Sarah's accident was handled differently. After the accident, and this, this was in the morning, I was sent home. Um, you know, I, I, I took some Tylenol and I slept for most of the day. I woke up the next morning and I got suited again and I was so sore. And, you know, I, I went to work and I had told my supervisor, I was like, I'm, I'm really sore. And, you know, he said, well, you probably are going to be. Um, so I, I did my shift, you know, my full shift that day, went home woke up the next morning and on day two I got dressed and I went to go grab my seatbelt from behind me and I couldn't even lift my arm to grab the seatbelt. The day after the accident Sarah asked for medical attention but after expecting to be sent to a doctor by the department her supervisors relayed a startling revelation. Day two when I told him that something was wrong I told him I needed medical attention and um, my supervisor said that they had talked to the county treasurer, which is our HR. And she stated that it wasn't gonna be a workers' comp issue because the third party on scene that had hit me had claimed fault. So I would have to go through their insurance for my medical. Even more irregular was the fact her supervisor waited until April 30th, nearly two weeks later, to fill out a work-related injury report, citing a left shoulder injury resulting from the vehicle accident. All the while, the single mom to a four-year-old daughter was paying for treatment of an on-duty injury utilizing her primary insurance, meaning the deductibles, co-payments, and patient out-of-pocket expenses were her responsibility. And with the pain getting worse, her physician ordered an MRI, which revealed she had suffered an injury of devastating consequence. 
the MRI report came back that I had a five millimeter herniation in my C5 and C6, and it was also causing compression on my root nerve. So that's where the pain in my shoulder and then the pain in my hand was coming from was the compression in my spine. Sarah received the MRI results on May 22nd, immediately entering a series of protocols for treatment, which included painful epidurals as a method of potentially avoiding surgery. Meanwhile, she continued to work notifying her supervisors of the severe spinal injury she incurred in the line of duty while hoping the department would get her the care she now desperately needed. And their response? My lieutenant called me on into the office and he told me that my self-initiated um, work was, was going down, um, that I, I wasn't getting out there and doing what I needed to do. The pain became progressively worse over an eight-week period, one month of which her supervisors were aware of the severity of her injury and allowed her to work in a full capacity as a deputy sheriff anyway. Sarah worked from the date of the accident through June 20th, 2018, her final day of full duty. Every time I turned my head to the left, I would get dizzy. And it got to the point where halfway through my shift, I couldn't stand, I couldn't see, I couldn't walk. I, I didn't know what was going on. And I, I drove to the EMS in my patrol car and I called the sheriff and I said, Sheriff, something's wrong. And um, he told me to go to the hospital. When an officer incurs a physical injury, it, um, it will often affect them mentally. When they realize, oh, I can't be on the force anymore or I'm at a desk, they lose a lot of their income, their benefits. They may have to sell their house. They can't support their children, their family. Uh, it's horrific what happens to them. If I've had blow after blow after blow to my brain, and then I also have these other pressures, these other really, really big difficulties where I'm not getting support and I'm, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm having to fight to get the help I need. That just makes the overall brain more vulnerable. When the city, when the department takes away their pay and their benefits, they feel completely abandoned, especially because they've been given this dream of this is a police family, we look after our own. That's a total fabrication. Sarah continued treatment through the summer of 2018, with her doctor determining by fall she needed surgery, as all other methods had failed. She was now responsible for thousands in medical bills and was completely abandoned by her department, the county and workers comp until she received a letter in October stating the county treasurer had approved her for a visit with a designated doctor six months after the accident, effectively starting the process over with surgery already scheduled. Nobody talked to me about the workers comp system. Nobody told me this is how it works. Nobody explained what a designated doctor was. All I got was a letter in the mail and you know they had already canceled one doctor and so i finally had this next and surgery was so close for me that relief the 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 thought of not having to be in pain anymore it was all i it's all i could think about was getting rid of the pain and then getting back to work as, as fast as possible after sarah's refusal to start the treatment process over again a decision was made by her department to cease her workers comp benefits putting a tremendous financial strain on her family. And yet getting the surgery done was still her primary focus with the debilitating pain of her spinal injury wreaking havoc in her everyday life. Weeks later, on November 18th, she received a letter from her employer revealing a crushing setback. I opened up my mailbox and I had a letter and it said that I was no longer employed at the sheriff's office. I was given no meeting, I was given no phone call, I, I got a letter in the mail and it told me to turn in all my gear. It said that I had been an asset to the county, but for the county, they needed to provide patrol services. And I haven't talked to anybody since. Now with no income or primary health insurance, Sarah faced the daunting task of navigating the 2018 holiday season while finding a way to pay for her surgery. I had to start asking people for help. I couldn't, I couldn't go apply for another job. I was about to have surgery. Um, I was stuck. It was right before Christmas. I actually had a, uh, a charity donate toys so my daughter could have toys for Christmas. Um, 
It was a very, very sad holiday. Sarah had surgery on January 8th, 2019, taking out a personal loan of $43,000 at an interest rate of 33% in order to pay for it. I've had to depend on everyone. Um, I've had to apply for charities. I've had, I've had to ask people for money. I went from being successful in my career and thriving to completely just the bottom of everything. The surgery gave Sarah her quality of life back, though she still suffers from nerve damage in her left hand and maintains her life will never be the same as it was before the on-duty accident. Sadly, her story is not an outlier. It would be easy to single out her agency for the way she was treated, but this is a national problem where greedy insurance companies seek to maximize profits and city, county, and state governments enact laws that treat our law enforcement officers as a mere number in the system rather than the people they are. Yet another example of this is the story of John Lochran, a former sergeant with the Travis County Sheriff's Office in Texas, whose mental injury sustained in the line of duty was met with complete apathy by his agency, leaving him to cope on his own. An all too familiar refrain for the growing number of law enforcement officers who suffer from PTSD and depression. My deputy that was searching for her come from the other way with her lights, with his flashlight. That's when I knew that she was she was gone. Uh, I lost one of my, my troops. Um, I was in a wooded area and I walked kind of around the command post. I was by myself um, and I got down on a knee. I was telling myself, John, it's time to be a leader. It's time to be a leader. And that, that's the minute I believe I became a leader. The early morning of September 18th, 2014, was marred by severe weather causing flash flooding and dangerous conditions throughout the Lake Travis area. When an alarm call signaled a potential unsafe bridge crossing near the lake, Deputy Jessica Hollis arrived to investigate, immediately crashing into a massive flood of water that had already overtaken the area. She said, uh, 5 David 20, my vehicle's been swept away by water. Uh, and she gave her location. She was as calm as could be under those circumstances. Uh, she gave her location and uh, it was about a minute. I was the closest unit, about two miles away. So I started responding and there was no traffic on the road. I normally wouldn't put on my license sirens, but I put them on so that she would know that we were coming. Uh, and about a minute after her first call, she said, uh, 5 David 20, I think I'm near the bridge, I'm trying to get to a tree. And that was the last radio call. John was Jessica's supervisor in patrol, but the two were also members of the department's rescue dive team, with Jessica having served three and a half years and John for 16 years, recovering over 75 bodies from Lake Travis during that time. Now faced with a search for one of his own, John's team partnered with the Austin Police Department dive team in an attempt to locate Jessica's body. Jessica had drowned in the lake as the team found her a day later with John present for the recovery. She was raised, it was our dive team that recovered her, and she was raised into an American flag. It was very honorable the way she was brought to the surface and, and brought to the shore. As the department and city grieved Hall's tragic death, John was assigned by the agency to assist in coordinating the funeral while also speaking at the service. The burden of having lost a member of his squad began to take a tremendous toll, resulting in a negative effect on his family and their life at home. I was, I was depressed. You know, at work, I, I did everything I was supposed to do. I reported to work, you know, did, did a good job. But uh, at home, I was a complete mess. Uh, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't do things I enjoyed doing. I would go to my daughter's volleyball games, but uh, I wasn't there. It was an accomplishment. If by the time I got home from school, I was on the couch and not still in bed. And so I hate that they saw that, but uh, you know, they've also seen me recover. Examining a timeline of events brings forth a number of startling decisions made by John's superiors in relation to his mental injury. 
After being named Supervisor of the Year by his police association in 2015, a November 2015 issue involving the retirement and sudden use of Deputy Hall's radio call sign resulted in an internal affairs investigation and his being asked to take a fit-for-duty psychological exam. The January 2016 results of the exam diagnosed Sergeant Lochran with persistent depressive disorder, a mental injury directly caused by the trauma he endured while on duty. He applied for workers' comp and remained in that status until May 4th when the county attorney denied his benefits. The agency then assigned him to administrative duty pending the outcome of the internal investigation, which was sustained for insubordination in July of 2016. All the while, the agency showed Sergeant Lochran no compassion for his mental injury and instead determining the proper punishment was a demotion to deputy. The 24-year veteran was transferred to patrol effective in September 2016. I remember being notified when I was notified that I was going to be demoted. So I walked across the hall to uh, someone who runs our civil service and I told her I got demoted. And that was the first time. She's like, oh my God, why? I said, I, I think they blame me. I think they blame me for killing Jessica. And uh, it was like the first time I really felt that. And it's like, my agency added so much trauma. It's, it's not Jessica's death. I can process that. I can accept that. I, and I have. It's this agency I gave everything to turning their back on me. You know, like I say, it's not the initial trauma, it's how it's treated after that. When I started the research, I thought, well, you know, I've read about the police family, and it includes the department. And the department always supports its officers. So what do you think would be the single biggest source of stress for a police officer? The guy on the street? No. Cops say, oh, no, we can deal with him. It's the department. There is a very strong, stoic, strength-based culture within all first responder worlds. And that, that that starts in the academies where there's there's this sen sense of powerfulness and our strength and our, our ability to take care of business. And I think if for agencies, to start recognizing that officers are struggling would also force them to look at themselves because they're, they're police officers as well. It is how our cops are treated when they incur a mental injury in the line of duty that has created a stigma towards these conditions within the police culture. This video was created by John during his first day back in patrol on September 22nd, 2016. It's, it's kind of absurd. A couple days ago, I emailed my sergeant to let him know that I was in a mental health crisis. And I asked for training to be with a training officer, at least a reintegration program. And here I am. They found another reason to send me to another doctor for a fit for duty, one they selected. And I had a very good interview with him. I thought everything was going to be fine. And the report came back and it was, it described a crazy person. As a result of the department ordered fit for duty evaluation, and the resulting report, John was terminated from his employment effective March 23rd, 2017, ending his career of nearly 25 years. I was suffering with chronic pain. I was sitting at home, I was alone. My self-concept, my self-identity was, was being a police officer. And so I, I couldn't be a police officer. And then I had this pain on top of it, and then I was completely pushed away by my department, I lost, I lost every understanding or every thought of who I was, it was gone. The loss of my job, my career, my identity, my family is, weighs more heavily on me now than, than the critical incident of losing my deputy. The manner in which a law enforcement agency deals with line of duty mental injuries, such as depression and PTSD, is crucial in determining whether officers who suffer from these ailments will come forward and seek help. Sadly, the stigma associated with our cops' mental health is alive and well today, thanks to the draconian policies of many agencies who simply look to get rid of them instead of ensuring they get the treatment they need.
In 2019, Sarah McRee and John Loughran met for the first time as both were called to testify in front of a Texas House of Representatives committee formulating a bill to address the mental health of the state's law enforcement officers. Two cops brought together by trauma. The bill was never considered by the Senate and died in session. Yet another reminder of the work we still have to do. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Voices of the Blue. I'm Lieutenant Randy Sutton. Be safe. Take care of yourselves. Help is here when you need it.